Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. So welcome to the second of the third series of our webinars on evaluating digital health and evidence generation. The topic of today's talk is doing evidence generation within a digital health company. What are the challenges and most importantly, what are the solutions? We have over 180 people who signed up and you are all from versatile backgrounds, tech companies, healthcare, charities, universities. So this is really exciting and it also, also shows the need to discuss this, this practical topic. I'm Paulina, I'm a behavior scientist specializing in digital health and evaluation. And I'm one of the team members at UCL behind the webinar series. Um, so let me start by acknowledging our founders, which is University College London and King's College London. And it is a truly collaborative effort. And we work with Health Innovation Network and DigitalHealth.London. So please use Twitter hashtag evaluate DigiHealth. And today with me, co-chairing, we have Professor Henry Potts. He will be monitoring the engagement in the chat and curating the questions that you pose on the chat for our panelists. And we have two great panelists today. They both have vast and complementary skills and pragmatic experience in generating evidence in digital health, but also they share it with digital health companies. So our panelists are Dr. Rosie Webster, who is a science lead on the Venture Builder Program at Zinc. And we have Dr. Claire McCallum from Research and Development at Zinc. So without further me talking, let me, um, let me turn to each of our panelists for a bit of introductions. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all here today. My name is Rosie Webster. Um, I am also a behavioral scientist, so I have a background in um, health psychology. That was the area that my PhD was in um, and then done quite a bit of work in digital health and behavior change uh, before leaving academia, um, coming to the dark side. Um, and I've spent the last five or so years working in startups and scale ups within the digital health space, uh, doing both UX research, so user experience research, um, and also applied behavioral science. Um, most recently, I built the behavioral science function within Babylon Health. Um, and now, uh, as Paulina says, I, I work at Zinc, so I'm science lead for our venture builder program. Um, now, for those of you who haven't heard of us, uh, Zinc exists to bring the world of academic research um, and evidence and uh, particularly social sciences and startups and entrepreneurships closer together to solve society's most pressing issues. Um, so we do this from kind of both sides, both the academic and the business side. So, for example, our Catalyst program uh, with UKRI helps academics think in a more entrepreneurial way about how they create sustainable products and services from their research. Uh, but our flagship program, which is the program that I work on, is our Venture Builder program. Um, and this is where we take a cohort of individuals from a, a, a range of backgrounds who are interested to build a company around a social good mission. Um, so, for example, this current one is on child and adolescent mental health, and the next one will be on the environment. Um, and throughout uh, the program, so they have six months to kind of find a co-founder within the cohort um, and start to think about what product and business they want to build in that space. Um, and then we take them through to a six month accelerator program to, to, to continually build that business. Uh, and the idea is that they're grounded in science and evidence and research and really user centered. Um, so myself and Claire have been working on this program, helping the ventures to bring in that academic research, but also to do their own primary user research um, and to be thinking about evaluation. Um, so it's working very, very early stage. So we start from when the companies are nothing, the team doesn't even exist, um, kind of take them through to the first, first year of their life. Um, and then after that, they join our portfolio where we kind of continue to give them a, a light level of support um, over the kind of next few years. So we're very much kind of focused on that early stage. Uh, hand over to Claire, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, yes, a bit about me and then I'll say a bit about my role at Zinc. Um, so I did my PhD at Glasgow Uni and that was really focused on evaluating digital health technologies. Um, so looking at um, not necessarily alternatives to RCTs, but complementary 
research designs, experimental designs that you can rapidly optimize products before they get to the RCT stage um, using N of one and things like that. Um, so the PhD was looking at how we can make the most of these experimental designs, make the most of sort of passive data collection and sensors um, to get there. And um, PhD did also look at the more social side of using these research designs and what some of the barriers are um, within both academia, but also within um, industry contexts as well to actually doing evaluation. Um, and I've learned a lot actually in terms of what evaluation means, <laughs> both in an academic sense, where it's like a big kind of RCT towards more um, kind of quick experiments in industry as well. Um, I did my postdoc was shifting from just focusing on evaluation methods to actually development of a self-management app um, for a chronic condition. And then the evaluation we had to think about quite early because um, we did that fully remotely through the app store. So to try and improve the efficiency of the, the sort of experiment, if you like, um, of the research, we were embedding experimental design really early into the app. So thinking about the randomization process, thinking about the how users will sort of be um, confronted with taking part in an experiment in a very real world setting. Um, and then I was a lecturer for a bit at Bristol Uni in responsible innovation at digital health with a lot of trials and ethics and things. And now I'm at Zinc. Um, so that is um, really working. So with Rosie on the venture builder, which is the very early stage as Rosie was saying, and um, where they come and find their team and then build a product. Um, um, but I also work across the Venture Builder and the portfolio. So as Rosie was saying, the, the companies that have kind of gone through the Venture Builder, um, so the ones that make it to having a, a slightly more higher fidelity product, if you like, it's still not, you know, by all means finished, but very much um, getting it out into the real world. Um, so the experimentation possibilities are, are a bit different there. Thank you. That's very, very vast experience, sort of from this academic rigorous long taking long time resource intensive research to actually doing something quite agile in the companies in the real world so it would be good to hear a little bit more moving on to our first question i'm really excited so in terms of rosie you talked about those early stages of the journey what does evaluation look like at those early stages um, so I would argue that as soon as you're starting to design a product, you should be thinking about evaluation. And that's because to me, evaluation isn't just about, OK, we run a trial and we look at effectiveness. It's something that's embedded throughout the entire thing. So it's not even just about effectiveness. It's also about things like desirability and usability. And we should be evaluating in those ways from the beginning. Um, and then we should also be starting to, to create the building blocks for, for uh, later evaluations around specifically around effectiveness. So for example, things like user testing should be something that, you, that you're always doing from very early on, but particularly thinking about having clear goals for what needs you think that that product should, should meet and how people uh, need to be able to use it in order for it to be able to, effective, uh, to be effective. So you should be testing qualitatively whether um, the product that you're building meets those things, uh, but you can also be thinking about usability in terms of a quantitative uh, point of view. So for example, summative user testing, uh, looking at test success, errors made, things like that. Um, you can also be thinking about identifying risk of harm at this stage. So when we think about the effectiveness of products, it's not just whether they work, but it's also that they don't cause harm. Um, so you can think very early on about uh, whether that's something that you, uh, that you might be doing. So for example, uh, if you've got kind of like a, an assessment that's asking people questions about their health, that's giving them guidance, you need to make sure that they understand those questions correctly. So you're not going to end up giving them the wrong kind of advice. Um, so those are the kinds of things uh, that you can be doing very, very early. Um, we generally work with our ventures at the moment at Zinc to test ideas early on. So we do things like assumption mapping, so mapping out your riskiest assumptions and create hypotheses around those. So from the beginning, like building in that pro process of like, this is what we need to learn, this is how we will learn it, and this is when we know whether we're successful or not. Um, and we also get them thinking about their theory of change at an early stage. So that's one of the things that, that builds, starts to help build the building blocks of your evaluation later because you know what you're trying to impact and how 
Um, so defining the outcomes that they want to achieve. So kind of long term. So maybe they want to kind of like reduce depression or something um, or, or change some kind of like health outcome, like some uh, biological thing like HbA1c for a diabetic. Um, and then think about plotting out the mechanisms for how you expect to get there. So, for example, if you want to change that health outcome uh, like HbA1c, you may need to think about first change, like changing behavior. But then before that, be thinking about knowledge, motivation, self-efficacy, whatever the kind of pathway is from your products to that outcome um, and what this gives is then a clear guide for prioritizing features so you know like what you want to build based on the kind of different determinants it's going to target um, but also to think about what to be measuring when so um, you might want to start with those leading indicators around knowledge and motivation because actually it'll take you a long time to measure those longer uh, term outcomes that might only be measured in a blood test um, one of the other things that we do is encourage people to run pilots as soon as possible. So as soon as you've got a vaguely functioning MVP, like even if it looks nothing like the end product's going to look like, um, get it out there and test your assumptions in the real world. So if we think that like self-monitoring is going to be key, can we get them to self-monitor via WhatsApp when we haven't got an app yet? Um, and then kind of be starting to get those signals so you're unlikely to at that point have the numbers to be able to show effectiveness but uh, we can start to see both feasibility but also to uh, start to assess whether like perceptions of effectiveness or whether it fe feels useful and effective for people which it can be a good early indicator um, and that isn't something just for early stage companies as well I'd say that's something that we would also think about doing at Babylon for new features um, so even if you've already got an established product, you might be introducing a new feature to it. How can you test that feature early on? But, uh, that's, a, that's a quick, uh, very, very quick, but uh, very eloquent overview. So starting, don't think about effectiveness. First thing, testing, a lot of testing, qualitative, quantitatively, qualitatively, think about harms or unintended consequences theory of change, pathways to success or pathways to outcomes, prioritizing features and piloting. That's just a very quick summary. Right. Um, I'm sure we'll touch um, on some of these later on, but but Claire, moving to you and thinking about the later stage of development. Yeah. yeah so for the companies that have gone through the Venture Builder and are now our portfolios who we still offer support to. Um, so with these companies, we can start to look a bit more towards the end of like health related outcomes. Um, it's still not at the moment, you know, like health related quality of life and like the, the big ones that we would expect to shift after doing like a two or three year trial, if you like. So we're, we still definitely build on the theories of change that were worked through in the venture builder. These are going to be changing over time as well. Um, so we're still having kind of using those short term and long term or leading and lagging indicators, but more towards the, the health related lagging indicators. So thinking about, um, you know, it really depends on the company as well. And that's what I really like about Zinc is that you get to work across multiple portfolios who all have very different um, outcomes of interest. Um, I think the, the sort of the main differences are, as well as the outcomes in terms of health, you, it's, it's still not, I think when I started, I was like, right, okay, we can get on to, <laughs> you know, does it work or not? But here it's still very much about optimizing. And um, so who does it work for? Who does it not? Um, I think the, there, even at this stage though, they're still experimenting. So there are still quite UX kind of um, related questions that you can answer at this stage. And obviously it's all linked to effectiveness. Um, the product is more fully formed at this stage, so it's easier to have something to evaluate. Um, and so they also have a bit of more of a user base at this stage. It's still not obviously like the massive tech companies. That would be lovely to have thousands of users to test on or with, I should say. Um, <laughs> but mm. um, that then affords kind of a bit more meaningful if you were to bring in more you know, looking a lot more like an experiment, like we think in academia, where you, you manipulate factors um, and you can have control conditions and that kind of thing. And thinking a bit more, I guess, with a comparison to academia, thinking a bit more what those control, control conditions are in a way that's meaningful, um, doesn't require a lot of extra development costs, is maybe comparing to like usual um, care if the companies have access to that. Um, and I think the final thing as well is the motivations for experimentation and evaluation shift slightly. So in the earlier stages, we are asking and really pushing them to 
to pilot and to, to try and embed this good practice of doing experimentation and evaluation. I think um, later, you know, they're now out trying to seek more funding and more grants where you do often need, um, you know, like some evidence of, <laughs> of effectiveness or, or preliminary effectiveness. So the, the motivation becomes a bit clearer for them as to why they should embark on this journey, I guess, whether it's, as I say, grant funding or NHS uptake or need for clinical approval. So um, slightly easier in, in theory to kind of persuade them that this is a good, uh, but they can see it themselves, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I'd say that's kind of the key differences with the later stages. Mm -hmm. So moving towards health related outcomes and building on theory of change that we created. And so this is about optimization. Who does the work for manipulating factors? So looking a little bit like on at experiment, not necessarily randomized controlled trial. Exactly. Like you, yeah. That's why you said like an experiment, yeah. looking at control. Um, it's, it's interesting that you said, uh, it's kind of, you feel, talking about the motivation. So it feels like you guys influence the, the motivation behind what the company wants to do and why they potentially should think about longer term evaluation and seeking funding. Yeah, I'd say so. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Rosie, but I think they don't see it immediately, maybe. I guess it depends on their background. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that we like, like influence. So I think it's more about um, people come on the Zinc program because they want to have impact, right? They want to build impact businesses. Um, and that's a specific type of business that is likely to be interested in effectiveness. So I guess the kind of tools that we give them, which we don't say you have to do these things, but in we give them a suite of tools. These are the things that we think will be helpful to you that you kind of start doing right now that will put you in good stead later on. So really starting to bring in those building blocks. Yeah, definitely. And the language, I think as well, you know, I think it shifts from sort of experiments and, and really, I think all the time, it's still the motivation there to improve the product as much as possible in order to, to have the best impact, as well as these kind of external pressures of like needing to do an RCT. It's still, I think it's, they're, they're always very motivated to keep improving their product. So we can kind of build on that. Thank you. Um, that relates to, to, to our sort of second questions. And now we just explore a little bit the challenges. And actually, when we were planning it, if you remember, we were talking, oh, uh, Rosie, you mentioned, well, there are challenges and maybe we should focus more on the solutions rather than challenges. Companies would know their challenges. So I thought I'll summarize them. Maybe I'm in a good position because uh, we are running as part of this project uh, interviews with digital health enterprises to find out about their views, their obstacles, things that help them to do evaluation. Um, so uh, I'll just summarize the, the, the challenges briefly, limited budget, time, ever-changing product, lack of knowledge, skills, uh, competing priorities, i.e. staying afloat, economic vi viability. But there are also some views of the evaluation that, uh, that could be in themselves a, an obstacle to actually doing evaluation. And we summarize them into four myths. So evaluation is always resource intensive. So time, money, staff, burden on the user. Actually some evaluation, we argue, can be done quickly and cheaply. And there are tools and techniques that make it uh, less resource intensive. Um, Second one, evaluation is impossible at an early stage of the company's development. And you already, both of you mentioned when, you know, um, that this is actually important. There are important things to consider as early as possible, and this will pay off. Um, the third one is the outcomes of evaluation can be risky for the company. Um, when evaluation is considered in binary terms, answering unidimensional questions, does my product work? Yes, no. Actually, as we already heard, evaluation is much more complex than that. Um, and the last one is, um, there's often a view that the purpose of evaluation is just to meet regulatory standards to get your product into the NHS. For example, no need to evaluate so-called wellness apps. Actually, the regulation standards are in flux and change quite a bit. You might not need evaluation now, but it may change. So, so by doing evaluation, you can uh, future-proof or protect your products when you do evaluation. 
So this is just a summary, and I wonder what you think of that. Uh, what are your thoughts, Claire? Yeah, yeah, I can pick up on a few of those and definitely how we see them sort of at Zinc as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I think at Zinc, we um, take very much a risk-based approach to everything. So it's not just evaluation. So, you know, right at the beginning, they need to be thinking, as, as uh, Rosie was saying, we get them to sort of map their assumptions out and which are the biggest ones or the risks that could kill the business, if you like. And for some of them, particularly the ones that are going more down the sort of medical route or, um, you know, are targeting very severe mental health, for example, in the current um, mission that we're on, um, where the biggest risk for the company is that it doesn't work, yes, no, if you like. And so that is something to be tackled quite early. Um, whereas for other companies, you know, and I think um, even for, for wellness or for some other ones, you know, it's less of a risk if, the, if, if it doesn't work or not. But definitely, as you were saying, um, we're trying to sort of shift that thinking. It's not just about that yes, no question, but actually with these more agile forms of um, experimentation that you can do. It's less about this big, scary RCT that you, you kind of um, have at the end. And it's actually, if we can treat it more like we do with the kind of engagement test, like small, tiny experiments to keep incrementing, then it's, it's you know, you don't get that big um, blow at the end. So um, I think if we can think about it more like that, it's, it's definitely helpful. The ever-changing product is definitely a challenge. I think especially as we take them so early on where, you know, I know that particularly within like the literature, the RCT doesn't necessarily cope so well with, um, you, know, mod, you know, apps or wearables that are continuously modified as new like uh, versions come out. But here the shift is so great, like with early startups, you know, you're pivoting, you're, you're constantly testing whether even it's the right like target population or the right solution, particular components. So the shifts are quite big. It's not like, oh, should we use blue or green? You know, it's, it's um, mm -hmm. so that makes evaluation and, and the, the resources that you put into finding out the right outcome measures and all that kind of stuff, all the more tricky, I guess. Um, I think to add as well, just a final thing. So another challenge that we've had and dealt with um, or tried to tackle, I should say, is around the burden of, so I don't know if this came up um, for you, but the, the burden of doing evaluations on the users and how crucial that is to try and reduce. So, um, I mean, at this early stage when they don't have many users, but also in the portfolio when they are using up, building up a user base and actually you don't want to kill it <laughs> with, um, oh, can you like, you know, take part in this, answer this 40 question survey and um, we'll ask you like 20 times over and we'll, you know, you might get a good version of the, the app or the, the bad version. <laughs> um, so I think we have to think about that quite carefully. So we do sort of, um, you know, there's some tips that we recommend around like, you know, reducing the number of questions, trying passive data collection as much as possible, really letting, you know, setting expectations with the users. And there's always this balance between, you know, the rigor that comes with a 40 question survey um, versus like, you know, how, how much do we need um, of that? Which dimensions are the most important to pull out so that we're not um, sort of over, overwhelming our users? Thank um, you. Rosie, do you have any other thoughts? And yeah, I guess the only thing that I would add is I think like all of these things like feel like challenges. I think they're all surmountable based on, you know, everything that we said earlier and everything that Claire's just said. But I think that the the thing that you need to decide is do you want to be an impact company? Because not all companies do, not all companies have to be. Um, but like, do you do you want to have an impact on outcomes or do you want to get engaged or do you want to just get engagement and make money like and I think both are absolutely fine but I think you need to make a conscious decision as a business about like which one you want to do like which one is important to you because then that sets the culture like the right kind of like culture with evaluation as a mindset if you want to be an impact company because if you want to have impact you need to know what works therefore you need to measure what works and then you learn from that and that's only how you improve and continue to have impact and have more impact so I think if you decide, yeah, we want to be an impact company, we want to have an impact on those outcomes, um, then you need to kind of then build the company and your processes and everything that you do around that. So you, it needs to be evaluation by design, essentially. So 
you should be thinking about when you're measuring success. It should be about outcomes rather than outputs. It should be focused on those like outcome impact measures rather than just how many people are using the product. Although, of course, that's that's important in itself as well. Um, use things like OKRs, so objectives and key results, um, but use them well. Um, and, and be thinking about the outcomes that you're trying to deliver. When you're building your roadmap, when you're thinking about your product mode roadmap, think about what you're trying to achieve, not necessarily what you'll deliver. And if you kind of do that, then you set yourself up to be able to give yourself a space to choose the right things to build that you think are gonna have impact and then like measure those things. Um, so I think if you do that, and then you can kind of build into your processes all that stuff that Claire was saying around, like it doesn't have to be big bang, it can be kind of like small and as you go along. Um, like I think like all of that then flows from it, but it all makes Kind of needs to come from the top um, uh, with that decision of whether this is something that you care about as a company or not. Mm. Building the, uh, was it the the mindset, what you said before, the mindset of, of evaluation. That's really, really interesting. Um, and that you can do either or. Yeah, you can decide. Um, let's move to some practical tips. So if you were there's there's a lot of information there and actually already some practical tips in there um it's a huge question but how you can you embed evaluation into everything you are doing uh, in terms of digital health companies i can pick up on that first um i think the key thing that i've been learning that everybody should have <laughs> is a, a theory of change because you know, and really practical as in like, not just having it in your head, but literally making the diagram, simplifying it, modifying it where necessary. And that's your like map for evaluation. And you can tackle small bits of that, like, you know, with a small experiment rather than the whole thing. So that is a way of embedding evaluation into everything you're doing. You're constantly, you know, if you're testing one thing, you can then look at the results and just like the, the build and measure, you know, the cycle that the Rosie was talking about really continuously um, modifying that so very practically in an ideal world just keep coming back to that um, and not just sort of parking it um, I think another thing that you know thinking about measures actually you can do that sort of within everything you're doing not just in terms of um, how the company's getting on um, and maybe how you know involved the clinicians are but like you know your health outcomes you already know quite early the kind of final outcomes that you want to hit so you can always have that in mind um, and, and be thinking about how you're going to get there so again like Rosie was talking about these leading and lagging indicators are the short-term and long-term outcomes so practically I guess having a think about you know again it's that theory of change it's like it's in there <laughs> you've got the short term and the longer term outcomes um, I think another thing that you can be constantly doing is is how, thinking about how your users are going to be experiencing any elements of evaluation. So from that early sort of testing of like A-B testing of small things um, to do with the interface, for example, um, you know, you can pilot the process, you know, even your T's and C's or informed consent, keep piloting that process of participants so that you can get almost like a seamless experiment by the end, because that takes time, I, I think. So practically just keep thinking about how you can reduce that. Um, Claire, something you mentioned before in terms of one of practicalities, you said you can you, you can try to think about passive data collection methods instead yeah. of, could you just ex Yeah, to, yeah, definitely. So I think some lend themselves more to it than others. We're not quite there with passively understanding the mental health <laughs> sort of state of someone yet. Um, or, or I guess we are, but I think practically, you know, behavioral outcomes or, or you know, sensor based outcomes. So I did a lot of my PhD on, you know, the, the value of commercial sensors that are not big extra kind of um, clunky sensors that you put on, on folks. So can we be using the device that they are running you know, the product on already as a form of data collection so that it's not burdensome um, doing things remotely as well so that you don't need to have them into the office or, or the lab if you like but most likely an office um, in this context so thinking about how we can yeah reduce that impact and, and them not having to think about it and then there's also you know ecological momentary assessment or uh, this ESM sampling method so um, those ways of just you know, it's like alternative ways of collecting data that the user just doesn't have to think about it. There's definitely challenges with using a device 
that's the intervention to collect the data and that it becomes very confounded with intervention use and whether they feel like the surveys. Um, so I'm kind of developing my thinking on that, but yeah. And what's the advantage of using a ecological momentary assessment for those who don't know, do not know what that is? Yeah, I can quickly explain. So I guess just um, to me and um, a lot of these EMA or ecological um, momentary assessment and experiencing sampling method is just short questions and really in context. So particularly with products that are out into the real world, we want to know if they're working as planned. Um, and so it's not having to ask your user to sit down for 20 minutes and fill out this questionnaire. It's very quickly, how are you feeling right now? Trying to make them as engaging as possible, you know, like sliders rather than having to go through lots of, you know, it's just, it, it, there's a lot that it, it, evaluation by design, as Rosa was saying, is, is really important about how you, how you go about that. Rosie, anything? Um, yeah, I think just firstly, following on from Claire's point about practicalities, I think for me, it's about thinking about the minimum confidence that you need. So I think as an academic, when we're doing kind of RTTs and stuff, it's much more about getting towards certainties, although I know, you know nothing's certain, but we're, you know, we're trying to really, really have that robustness. I think often in like a product development, more startup environment, what we're thinking about is like, what's the minimum confidence that we need to move forward here? Um, and I think having that mindset can be really, really helpful. Um, also, following on from what Claire was saying about theory of change, I think one of the other things that, that we do at Zinc really well, which I don't think that we've talked about so far, is like a, a slight step before that theory of change, which is having a really well-defined problem statement. So knowing exactly what the problem is that you're solving for people and like and why. And we have like a format that determines, you know, the user group, the actual problem, and then like what that problem is causing. And then that starts for you for to be thinking about those outcomes. So if again it goes back to if you decide that you want to be that impact company, like maybe, you know, thinking about that problem statement should be something that's part of what's your, you know, company vision, product vision, uh, things like that. So uh, bringing that in can be really helpful. Um, I would also say, I mean, I would definitely, you know, I would of course say this as a UX researcher, but really make time to prioritize UX research. Um, so have the time set out and the processes for doing uh, user testing, qualitative discovery research. I can't stress this enough. Like it will be really worth it in the time saved, like redoing things when you built them and actually they don't work for people. Um, I think the, you're much more likely to have impact and be successful in your evaluation if you've really taken the time to fully understand the problem and deliver something that, that, that really works for people and you've tested it um, at those early stages. Um, and I think lastly, going back to what I was saying earlier about like, you know, making that like evaluation and impact stuff like being a thread through everything that you do, be thinking about how you can embed that in your processes. Um, so structuring learning. So for example, uh, uh, an asset that I find really useful is the strategizer test card, which is a really good way to like lay out your hypotheses. And you can do that for everything, whether it's like a user test or an experiment that you're running, but really helps to, to kind of structure your thinking and make sure that you're kind of staying true to yourself with that. Um, and it's even about things like, you know, thinking about your like sprints and tickets and like conversations that you're having as a team or a product squad about like how you're, like, what you're working towards, where you're going, like what your goals are, um, be kind of bringing those things in. Um, and lastly, I think it's just really key to have good robust processes for experimentation um, because some companies do this really well, some companies don't, don't do it so well. Like in academia, we have the RCT, the like industry equivalent is an A-B test. Like if you need to have good processes for A-B testing um, and that will be the key to being able to easily like test whether things that you're introducing are actually having a differential impact um, on the outcomes that you're interested in. And how do you create good processes for A-B testing? Just to follow up. Hire really good people who know about experimentation would be my first suggestion. Um, but there are actually lot, tons of tools out there to help you to do it. So Optimizely, for example, is a really big one. Uh, like these tools exist for you to not only set up the experiments in a really easy way without needing dev support, but then also to be able to analyze the data, even if you're not a statistician or don't know anything about stats. Um, so there's the, yeah, there's tons of tools, but I think ultimately to have like a good strategy for it, like I think it helps to hire either a researcher who really knows well how to do experimentation or uh, a data scientist who's specifically an experimentation specialist. 
I'm glad you mentioned that because actually, Rosie, I was thinking when I was writing those myths that I do I would not want to go other ways to show uh, to trivialize evaluation. Say no, this is easy; anyone can do that. And as you you mentioned, there is time and place to get a researcher on board, to get a specialist on board. Another thing: uh, is there any other times where you think that that's necessary? I'm thinking about statistical analysis. You know. Uh, I go for help if I need. <laughs> it really depends yeah. who's part of your team and what it is that you're trying to do. Mm. I think if you're doing those um, like smaller experiments that are really helping you to increase your confidence, like hopefully you'll have enough skills in-house to be able to, to do that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but I think, I guess, if you were then going to later think about more formal evaluations, like if you did then want to think about like running an R RCT to, to be able to have publishable research out of what you're doing, then at that point, like we'd probably be advising the ventures that we work with to find an academic partner to work with. So they're kind of, you're still able to concentrate on the product, they can concentrate on the evaluation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's great. Any, any other uh, practicality, practicalities you might think of? We oh, I can think off the top of my head, Claire, I don't know if you've got anything else. We can move to the questions, actually. I've got, I've got one question that relates to the, the interviews, which often companies see formative evaluation, which is more sort of product development, and mm -hmm. summative evaluation, the sort of the effectiveness of safety or, or looking at the risks um, as a separate thing. And they really, it's either you're doing development of a product or you're either doing evaluation of effectiveness or efficacy. But everything from what you said is just this, those two things go in parallel. Mm. Yeah, they go, to me, they go hand in hand and like you should be doing all of it, ideally. It's like the, what you're doing and how you're doing might depend on where you are. But I think as is the same with all research, I think it's less about like, oh, we're in this phase now versus this phase now. It should be asking those questions. What are the things that we need to test right now? What are those assumptions that are riskiest? What is it that we're trying to learn? And therefore, what is the method that's the right thing to do that rather than feeling like you have to follow a particular structure because like you kind of like, you learn that like, oh, you know, there's this like double diamond and there's the formative versus the summative and like there's, there's this process, but in reality, it's far more messy than that is like chaos. So I think it's about taking like in each moment, thinking about what it is that you need to learn and picking the right method for that. Claire, I don't know if you've got anything to add. Yeah, no, fully agree. I think um, getting used to that chaos is, uh, is, is challenging when you come in as a researcher, um, but I think you need to meet them where they're at. There's no point in trying to, like the, at the top of their mind uh, with a, a company is, is most often their user base as I say so if you're trying to like bring in anything that is going to um kind of jeopardize that then you know that that will just kill a lot of stuff so I think just being mindful of that um is what I would add. that's that's an amazing way to 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 finish this part of conversation just just get used to the chaos and try to structure the chaos if, if you can and we create all those you know frameworks for doing this or that like you just mentioned Rosie but actually life is messy and evaluation is messy yeah yeah and sure. over to you Henry are there any questions from the audience that you'd like to ask so let's start with a very quick and easy one uh does zinc support international startups or do you just want to say more generally um how how do people get involved with zinc if they <laughs> so i mean there are a number of ways you can get involved with zinc highly recommend i know henry posted the uh, uh website so thank you so highly recommend signing up to our newsletter for the stuff that's coming out because soon we're going to be uh launching recruitment for our next venture builder on the environment so we keep an eye out for that um so what i will say is like i'm not 100 clear on what specifically they were asking but i'm going to take a guess um but it's worth clarifying that zinc doesn't in that we don't we're not like a standalone vc in terms of people come to us and pitch to us and then we invest in them we we invest in companies as part of our venture builder program 
So if you if you come on our venture builder program, then and then want to build something that goes beyond the UK, that is fine. But the way that we currently work is the venture builder is run in London. You have to be in London, um, and and then you have to register as a company in London. But that doesn't mean that you then have to only operate in the UK. You can kind of go and look to other things. But if you were an existing startup that's outside the UK, that's not the kind of thing that that's invested. Unfortunately, I'm afraid. Thanks, Rosie. Let's move on to some trickier subjects. So a lot of people asking around the challenges of institutional approvals and things mm -hmm. like ethics permissions. Do you have any advice on how to navigate that world and when when is it necessary and when is it not necessary? Do you want to take that, Rosie, or shall I have a bash and then you can pick up on it? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to go for it? Me even. Um, so again, another kind of sort of uh, shift in thinking from academia, where it is very much ethical approval, stamp of approval. And um, I think what we try to do um, at Zinc, and, and I think is a, is a good way forward, is thinking about ethical principles. So the, the first thing is that if you are working with NHS patients or clinician, you will need NHS ethics and, and you go through that process. Um, but otherwise, you know, we would do things like guerrilla research. You basically um, try and have the ethical sort of foundations in your head. We, you know, Zinc will, you know, encourage things like informed consent processes um, and, and the, the, basically the process of, of going through an ethics application, we talk through it with them, encourage them to talk through it, a lot of dialogue. Um, we don't, you know, it's that stamp of approval from a, uh, sort of the risk that the university take on by, by that doesn't happen in this space. Um, so I think it's, it's trying to sort of convey and, and think about what the, you know, things like thinking of broad principles like the risk to the the, pay, the, the users of taking part versus the benefits of the potential product um, and things like the you know making it super clear from the outset um, that they are right free to withdraw they don't have to give any sort of reasons um, from taking part in the research but um, yeah it, it's an interesting one where you know I think it's, it's it's not just discarding ethics entirely, but you don't, you know, it, it's really thinking about the, the principles. And as I say, if you can ha have that same discussion, I mean, if you think of an ethics application, a lot of it is just getting you to think about it and making sure, you know, other people will encourage you and challenge you on it. And we try and do that at Zinc. And um, Rosie, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, yeah, I think, as Claire said, it's less about getting the Go, like having to do the red tape, but still behaving ethically, right? Um, I think obviously a complication there is, as you said, like when you are doing research with the NHS or accessing patients via the NHS, then you do have to think about these things. Uh, although as Henry put in the chat, I think if you, if you class it as like service evaluation or service improvement, you don't necessarily always need um, approvals from a research ethics committee. Um, I think it's the HRA who've got a tool that you can go through to decide whether your, your project is considered research. And I think one of the key factors is whether the findings are going to be generalizable. So if you are just doing like looking at one particular part of the service and your findings are just going to feed into improving that service and you're not going to publish it and it's not going anywhere else, it's much less likely that you need ethics approval. Um, but when it comes to our ventures in Zinc, uh, we generally kind of have to encourage them to like find other avenues to recruit people basically so if you recruit people not by the nhs then we don't need to get that like eth ethical approval uh, but as Christ says we still do kind of behave ethically we do still kind of have those processes in place um but yeah it's kind of yeah. like something you have to think about and work around i think as well you know as as well as those processes in place we do have like safeguarding and you know we've got a psychiatrist on the team and sort of running things through with the zinc team but also having you know we do have processes there um and and thinking you know how can you know thinking about what the risks are how can you mitigate them using resources that are available on like you know how to reduce the impact of even asking people questions about their mental health what impact is that going to have on them and, and so yeah you definitely go through the same process um, it's just, you know, not, not as um, reliant on, on one body saying yes, on you go. But we also, I think, try and encourage people to think of this more 
and something quite keen on is like you know ongoing ethics so not just like right okay I've had this um, approval signed off I can go ahead and proceed and whether or not people are showing us that they don't want to keep going but actually keep having that conversation and with the, the users and the people that are taking part as to whether they know what they're doing know what they're sort of providing us with what the input is going to be and um, how we're going to use it all that kind of yeah thing. continuous consent exactly yeah Thanks. I mean, I think it is a, a a minefield, and it can be slow. The NHS bureaucracy, although you know, the sooner you start, the sooner you can get to it. Um, it, it doesn't have to take a long time. The forms are long, but often the forms are, you know, a lot of the form you just go, it's not applicable. You know, the form will ask thing ask you things like, you know, are you using radioactive? substances in your study and I'm presuming none of us here are using radioactive substances in our study so you can just say no and go to the next box so so don't be scared of these forms um we had another question which was sort of on a similar topic which was around the importance of uh having pre-registered protocols when when doing evaluation when doing research um how how necessary are they do you use them I will jump in very quickly here and again Rosie can probably expand but <clears throat> rather than so we do encourage them to have like a protocol for the plan of a pilot for example we all we really um with the strategizer cards that Rosie was talking about we really get them or, or sorry get them invite them and work with them through it on uh think about hypotheses you know what do they plan what do they expect to happen what are they you know given you know either previous experiments or given the literature which they we rely on a lot as well and um, so having this we don't make the protocol public and put it on like clinicaltrials.gov um, at this you know at this early stage you know when they're doing those rcts that are um then i expect we would but i think at this the moment it's it's having a plan and setting out your hypotheses like you would but not necessarily having something that you refer you know the, the public to um rosie is, is there anything else you want to add to that yeah, in my experience, the kind of evaluation for the purposes of like within a company, like we wouldn't even often we wouldn't even publish the output. So we'd, it's highly unlikely that we'll publish the protocol, although I know in, like, you know, some places are interested in, in publishing. Um, but yeah, I think I would only be thinking about that if we were doing like a, a big like effectiveness evaluation around like with an RCT, in which case, as I said earlier, we'd probably be partnering with like we'd probably have an academic partner with that. Like they would probably be interested to, to publish a protocol. So I think a, an important message coming out of our, our discussion today is that evaluation isn't isn't one thing. Evaluation is something that you um, want to start thinking about early. Um, that evaluation can mean relatively small, simple, quick to do cheap things and but it's still useful in telling you whether what you're doing works and is going to work and how you make it better what we might call formative evaluation and then also at times not necessarily for everyone there are these bigger complicated clinical effectiveness studies or what we might call summative evaluations um where there is a uh, a complex infrastructure around ethics approvals and pre-registration protocols, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you're not going to be doing those straight off the bat, you know, that you will probably have an evaluation journey of smaller steps to see whether what you're doing works before you even get to one of these large trials, should that be needed. Um, and if it is, you're probably going to need input from uh, experienced researchers um but that brings us to another question which is you know if 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 i'm a if i'm a startup and i come to you and i ask okay so when should i start thinking about evaluation what would you say to me asap no i think um the as soon as you know so maybe it's controversial but i think as soon as you've got as, as a researcher or an intervention, you know, complex intervention development, we like to think of things in components. So as soon as you know what your mainly the main components or active ingredients of your tech or, or 
in this in this case is um, and the behavior change techniques and, and how that's facilitated digitally. Breaking those down and thinking, okay, what is each of those actually trying to do? So is it trying to facilitate social comparison? How good is it that that, that you can start doing evaluation at that stage? And even really prototype, you know, usually you'll just have a very rough prototype of that component and you can already start evaluating that. So I think as soon as you know what your product looks roughly like or the main things that will be in it, um, you could also take it the reverse where you know exactly <laughs> what what the outcome is that you're ultimately wanting to get to. Um, but I think, and, and then work backwards and think about, okay, what should we have in the intervention, which also makes sense. But I think often, you know, we're thinking and about the, the, the components or the tech involved, but also the, the behavior change techniques and things that are in there. And as soon as you've got those and the rough parts of your um, intervention, then then I think you can start thinking about evaluation very granularly then. I would actually argue that technically you're thinking about evaluation even sooner than that. As soon as you, are, as I was saying earlier, making that decision that like, yes, we're a company that wants to have impact and you're determining what you want to have impact on. So that goes back to that problem statement thing. So you're defining like, this is the thing we want to change. That technically is thinking about evaluation because from that point you are laying the groundwork for like for where you're going to go. So I think as soon as you start thinking about what it is that you're trying to achieve, technically you are thinking about evaluation. I think that then starts to become more concrete when, as Claire's saying, you've, you've got like, you know, components of the product that you're delivering and have ideas around like how they might have an effect. That's when you kind of start to think about that theory of change stuff. And that's when you then it then kind of starts to crystallize a little bit more. Um, but I think if you've made that decision that you are a company that wants to have impact, as soon as you're kind of thinking about what you're going to have impact on, you are thinking about evaluation. I would agree. It's like, what is thinking about evaluation? But as long as, as you were saying, Rosie, having that mindset from the beginning um, will definitely set you on the right track super early. Yeah. Thanks both. Um, back to you, Paulina. I think I've got one more question as a follow-up you mentioned claire the active ingredients or you mentioned as, as behavior change techniques this this evaluation that we haven't actually discussed and looking at your tech and looking sort of defining how it how, what it does and what are the active ingredients and that's something that shows the multidisciplinarity of of digital health so are there any other tools you mentioned theory of change we've got uh, one in our chat the strategize strategizer is there any other tools that you would recommend to look at and use, maybe from behavior science? For thinking about, well, I mean, I use combi a lot and <laughs> behavior change techniques, um, you know, it doesn't cover all of them. And there are things that, it, there are things, something that I've definitely learned is there are things that um, health tech is delivering that doesn't necessarily act as a behavioral technique or you know cognitive but has other things that help to still help to get you to that final outcome so things that you know therapists might do that are not necessarily a clearly defined technique and I think you could argue with that and say that everything is, is a technique but I think things like something within the chronic condition uh, management that I was working on things like about how you go around validating the condition um, and, and making people feel heard and that kind of thing is something that tech can do that is not necessarily, you know, we've not found that that granularly as a technique to, to facilitate that. So I think there's there's still gaps between what we, you know, the research that was done in, in terms of understanding what sort of key ingredients are from a behavioral perspective versus other things that tech is doing to deliver and still helping you achieve that outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with Claire, I think in terms of like planning and defining intervention content, then the behavior change technique taxonomy, combi, the theory and techniques tool that kind of brings those two things together. Um, hopefully Henry's quickly looking for links to share so for one of these things. <laughs> That's a challenge, you've got five minutes. Um, uh, but yeah, I think like they're helpful for kind of delineating like key active ingredients that we know from behavioral science, for example. But I think when it comes to breaking down your product into components, it's about thinking about um, like, which are the things that you expect to have like a differential impact? 
because that might be like oh it's this self-monitoring tool or it's this like physical like part of a physical product but as Claire's saying it's also kind of those slightly it's like more intangibles around it could be like the relationship that they have with a coach that you give them and things like that so what are the specific um things that you expect to have differential impact on your outcomes and I think it's trickier here I remember Rosie it was really fun and engaging to think about this with you when we were deciding about presenting a theory of change and what it is and like things that are not like individual behavior change techniques but still like are the secret sauce because a lot of the things will you know it'll be about how coherent is the entire intervention these things that run through, you know we think of things or I think of things quite modularly um but obviously there's interactions between different techniques but there's also things that run through the entire product that you would expect to even if they're related to engagement they're still having that effect on or like it was still an outcome to, to measure mm. and it and it really brings it back to how important is this theory of change as you said and sort of having it and changing it and having it as a living document yeah I would um, agree yeah. yeah well we have to wrap up now unfortunately Thank you so much, Rosie. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, and huge thanks to our attendees. Um, thank you to digitalhealth.london for technical lead. Um, they will be sharing the recording, which will go live in the next day. Um, so please share with anyone that you might think be interested or might find it useful. Uh, do join us for our next webinar, which is on how can clinicians find the right digital therapy for their patients. And that's on the 23rd of May. Um, thank you and have a good afternoon. <laughs>